Congregation may be seated. Of course, we're in week five of what we're calling our happiness project. And you know, a lot, of, a lot of people, they make the mistake of believing that happiness is just a matter of luck. Of luck. And there we go. Just a matter of luck. They think that happy people are lucky people and unhappy people are just unlucky. Actually, nothing could be farther than the truth. Um, happiness is a quality of life. It doesn't happen automatically, but what Paul is saying in Philippians to us is it's something you can learn, something you can perfect and receive from God. And, and that's what his letter to Philippians is. And, and you probably never thought about this, but you just instinctively realize that there are little qualities that are happy or unhappy in life. And, and today in the scripture lesson, he's going to go over four qualities of a happy life to be identified for us. And, and you do this, you, you do this almost on an instinctive level. Just imagine if there are, are two columns that you're going to put things in, and uh, column one is unhappy, and column two is happy column, and, and where would you put impatience? Which column? Where would you put it? Happy or unhappy? Impatience. Did somebody say unhappy? Unhappy. Unhappy, that's right. And, 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 but if you learned to be more patient, where, where would you put it? That would be that would be happy. Learn to be more patient. What about cruelty? Where would, what column? Happy or unhappy? Unhappy. unhappy. What about arrogance and self-centeredness? Happy, unhappy? <laughs> there you go. And we do this on an instinctive level. The, the qualities of happiness, we're so very aware of them. And, and Paul today, in the scripture lesson we're about to read together, as we go verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through the book of Philippians, the happiest book in the Bible is going to identify four personality qualities that you can learn to build into your life, and you can be happy. The background of the scripture lesson I'll read to you this morning is, well, Paul has got a few good men as living examples for us to learn from. Of course, there's Timothy. You've, you've heard of uh, Timothy, the co-worker in Paul. And, and another guy maybe you haven't heard of before. His name is, I have to clear my throat for this one, Epaphrodias. I think today, would anybody like to repeat that name with me? Yeah, I think today, can we agree to just call him Eric? Yeah, yeah Eric. All right, F.A. for this, or Eric. And recall the setting. Um, it's about 50 A.D. That's about uh, 1970 years ago. Paul is imprisoned in Rome. He will be incarcerated for the last three or four years of his life. He's waiting for an appeal to Caesar in the royal court as the right of every Roman citizen. And he has received an offering from the church of Philippi, an offering to pay for his living expenses while he's under house arrest in Rome. And, he, and, and literally, the book of Philippians is his thank you letter back for this gift. And his thank you to them is to give him some, some insights into, well, what we're calling in this scripture, in this uh, Bible study, we're calling it the Happiness Project. Today's text is Philippians 2. We're picking up right where we left off last week with verses 19 through 30. If you're picking up the Pew Bible, it's on page 1260. And listen to God's Word and receive the joy of the Lord. Christ died that you might, that you might live in. Receive God's instruction and blessing from His living Word this day. Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse 19. Paul is writing to all the church, even you and I today. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. For everyone looks out for his own interest, not those of Jesus Christ, but you know that Timothy has proved himself because as a son with his father, he has served me in the work of the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him as soon as I see how things go with me. And I am confident in the Lord that I myself will come soon. But I think it is necessary to send back to you, <coughs> Eric, my brother, fellow worker, and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger, whom you sent to take care of my needs. For he longs for all of you and is distressed because you heard that he was ill. 
Indeed, he was ill and almost dying. But God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, to spare me sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore, I am all the more eager to send him, so that when you see him again, you may be glad, and I may have less anxiety. Welcome him in the Lord with great joy, and honor him like men, because he almost died for the work of Christ, risking his life to make up for the help you could not give me. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be God. You know, at first glance, that doesn't seem to be a big deal Bible verse. It doesn't seem to be a very deep passage. Paul's just talking about two guys who's with him in Rome, who he's, well, sending back home. You might initially reason that, well, that's not all that important. Surely we could just gloss over it, read over it, read over it quickly, not pay much attention. But you'd be wrong. You'd be missing a real treasure of joy in the kingdom of God. God has laid up for you. There are two guys in this story that Paul is writing, and he is holding them up as chosen examples of the qualities of life, qualities of life that lead towards, well, happiness. Look at what Paul is talking about about these two guys in verses 19 and 28, he says there's three reasons why their lives are exemplatory to us. He says that they've cheered him up. They'll make you glad. And they'll lessen our anxiety. Paul, like any pastor for his church at Philippi, for me and our relationship, like any pastor, Paul wanted his flock to know all the peace and to know all the joy and to know all the love and happiness their connection, their relationship with Jesus Christ could ever give them. And so he's encouraging in these 11 verses to look at the example of those four men, those two men and learn of their four qualities of hidden happiness and joy. Let's begin today. First quality of happiness Paul sees in uh, Timothy and in Eric is that in order to be happy, you need to shift your focus off yourself and on to others. Paul said it this way. Group read with me, verses 20 21. Paul said, I have no one else like him who takes a genuine interest in your welfare. Now this is something, well, almost supernatural. It's just natural, the natural state of, of all people, of humanity to look to their own interests before being concerned with anybody else. To look to my own first. I mean, let me ask you today, when you get up in the morning, do you ever wonder how many people are concerned about me today? Do you ever think, how many people are thinking, do I have a good day or do I have a bad day? Well, probably not very many. It's just human nature to think about ourselves first. And let me ask you, what do you think about what do you think about first? Could you name anybody who, well, has their self-interest, has your self-interest above theirs? Okay. Paul right. is saying to us, here is your example. Here's your example. I've got no one else like Timothy who has a genuine interest <coughs> in the welfare of others. Have you ever had that experience? Come on. We've all been to social events and everybody's walking around and they've got their party things in their hand and they have the conversation starters. What's your name? How do you like the party? How, how, how do you know the host? Um, have you ever been to Honduras? You know, all those practice, socially acceptable, conversational starters. And you take them seriously, you think, oh, they're really interested. You give them the answer, you notice why you're answering. Their eyes are looking off. They're looking over your shoulder. They're looking right through you. They're scanning the room. They're looking to see if there's anybody else there more important than you are. That can maybe contribute to their social or personal agenda a little bit more than you could. They need to make contact with and not really listening to anything you said, even though they pose the question. It's a practice. 
polite, conversational, social starter. Not really, not really about happiness, just about busy and success. Perhaps a little confession is good for the soul. I'll tell you that sometimes I personally have been terribly saddened and embarrassed when I've been so busy thinking about my needs and my agenda and my goals that I wasn't paying enough attention. And I didn't notice that somebody, somebody close to me was hurting or sad. That just didn't make me happy. In other translations, these verses, let me read you how some other contemporary translations uh, translate verses 20 and 21. In the English version, he genuinely cares for you. Others only care about themselves. Maybe that's why Paul picks Timothy as an example to learn from. In the Phillips version, they are all wrapped up in their own affairs. A friend of mine has showed me an article recently from a psychological journal. And this journal had indicated, well, uh, 20 years of journalistic research looking at one million American publications in the English language, English language publications in the last 200 years uh, since 1817. And they tracked the usage of words in the English language. And the, the top most growing words that are being used more and more in our contemporary society, maybe this will surprise you, maybe it won't, is I, me, mine, choice, unique, and special. Well, on the same time, the other side of that bell curve, the words that were once used widely that are disappearing from American, well, from English language publications are responsibility, duty, and prayer. Who are we really concerned about? Maybe that shouldn't surprise us. That most of the time we're just not all that happy. Paul says of Timothy, here's the example. I have nobody else who takes a genuine interest in others like Timothy. Second personality trait that Paul sees in Timothy and Epaphroditus, Eric is that happy people are trustworthy people. And their example is to challenge us to be trustworthy with one another. Trustworthy means that you're unique, that, that you are authentic and genuine and reliable. That's what it is to be trustworthy. You're the kind of person, you're the kind of person that when you make a promise and give your word, even if it requires an unexpected sacrifice or temporary discomfort, you follow through with what you promised that you will do. Paul says, here's a guy named Eric who just, just that. Let me give you a little secret. Let me give you just a little secret. An insight I'll share with you this morning. Have you heard of Equifax? Yeah. They didn't do too good in the trustworthy department, did they? No. People aren't too happy with them. Equifax is one of three national credit monitoring bureaus. Every time you get a loan, it's there. Your credit is checked with them. Are you stable? Are you reliable? Are you the kind of person that will do what you say? Are you a credible candidate to invest our resources in? But not just banks are doing credit checks on you. Let me give you, here's the secret. Everybody is continually doing their own credit check on you. And you're doing it on them. We're asking of one another silently, are you the real deal? Are you, are you really what you say you are? Are you dependable? They're monitoring your and mine and our and we're monitoring each other's integrity. You are. What is integrity? Proverbs 25, 13. Read it with me from the message version of the Bible. Reliable friends who do what they say are like cool drinks in sweltering heat. Refreshing. Integrity doesn't mean you're perfect. If perfection was the role, then none of us would ever make it because none of us, you and I included, none of us are perfect. 
Integrity simply means that you do what you say. That you live up to your word. That you're dependable. That you have the quality, that second quality that Paul sees in happy people of being trustworthy. That you keep your promises. Read with me how Psalms describes this joy in Psalm 15, 4. They always do what they promise, no matter how much it costs. So here is our happiness qualities number one and two today that Paul holds up in the life of Timothy and Eric. Here we are. That as you shift your focus from yourself to others, you will allow yourself to always be trustworthy. And then Paul holds up a third quality that he sees specifically in the life of, of Eric and by four days. And he holds this quality up and he says, learn, learn what this man has. Learn how to work well. Happy people, learn how to work well with others. Read Philippians 2.25 again with me today. I send back to you, Eric, my brother, my fellow worker, my fellow soldier, is also your messenger whom you sent to take care of my needs. <coughs> Notice this, this Eric guy. He, he knows how to work as a team to get along to work with others. You know, parents used to teach children that. I'm not a parent anymore, I don't know. But he used to learn that team value dynamic because parents taught us very strictly, at least me, you gotta, you gotta share your toys. And you gotta work together and pick those things up after it. The lone rangers of society, the prima donnas, the mavericks, they never get there. And their means happiness, they never get there because they are unable or have not yet allowed themselves to address the qualities, those first and second qualities. And they'll never get the teamwork and happiness. Now, notice what Paul says of Epaphordaeus. He says, he's my brother, my fellow worker, a soldier. This is somebody that I can have a family relationship with, I can have a working relationship with, and, and I can count on when we're in times of struggle, a struggle together. It holds him up as, as a third example. It, what we, to, to learn to work together, we need to learn to cooperate. Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, it's, well, very familiar in, in, in you know, um, uh, older editions. It's the Beatitude that will say either blessed are the peacemakers or happy are the peacemakers. In the message version of the Bible, uh, that, that, that recognizable verse is translated, you are blessed when you can show people how to cooperate instead of compete or fight. Learn how to cooperate with one another. It's a quality of happiness in life. Working well with each other. Well, where would you put? Remember the columns? We've got the happy column, the unhappy column. Where would you put conflict? Which column? Who, who's, who, where would you put it? Happy or unhappy? Cooperation. Happy. Learn to well, work together. Learn to cooperate. Learn to as Epaphore Deus, as example, Paul says, learn to be considerate of one another. Philippians 25, 26, read it with me. But now I must send him back to you because he longs to see all of you and has been worried about your distress since you heard that he was sick. He was considerate of their feelings. Well, some people say, I just tell it like it is. I, the first thing that comes out of my mind, I, I just say it to people. You know, there's a word for that. You know what the word is? It's rude. Any parrot can just parrot off the first thought out of their head without realizing what it'll do or what the ramification. Any idiot can say the first thing that just pops out of their mouth. But it takes character and intelligence and discipline. That's discipleship. To consider first words and actions and to be considerate of others. Paul's point here is in the example of, of Timothy and Eric, their, their teamwork, their consideration of others, their, their cooperation with others. That's a really a mature psyche, we would call it in our, in our modern age. He, he, he 
holds them up as examples of the quality of those who are happy. Well, have you ever seen people that are considerate? People that are considerate of, well, clerks and co-workers, colleagues and loved ones. They're thoughtful. Um, the guy who's a patron in a store and he's demeaning the clerk as hard as he can and pointing the finger and almost sliding at the mouse in his anger and distress. Come on, back to the columns. Is that happy or unhappy? It's unhappy. And Paul says, let's learn to be more considerate and cooperative and teamwork on others. Are these just isolated thoughts? Do they appear anyplace else in the Old or New Testament? Well, let's look at some other Bible verses. Read from the first, uh, first Corinthians with me. We'll read both at one time. Let's read them together. Paul says, you must get along with each other. You must learn to be considerate of one another, cultivating a life in common. I don't just do what I like or what is best for me, but what is best for everyone so that they might be saved. From my perspective personally to you today, for me, the key to happiness, I've realized the more considered I am, the more cooperative I am with, with friends, family, with others' needs and doubts and fears, with others' feelings of being vulnerable, the more I am considerate and cooperatory towards colleagues and co-workers and acquaintances and family and children and spouse and, and well fellow church members in the body of Christ, the more considerate and the more and the more team style I am with these people, like like Paul says, Timothy and Eric's Eric's um, uh, uh, qualities that he's showing to us, the more I am considerate of others, well, the happier my relationships are and the happier my life turns out to be. Fourth and final quality we're looking at this morning is Paul then goes on to says that a character of happiness is you've learned to live for something that's worth dying for. Read with me Philippians 27. Indeed, he was very ill and almost died. He risked his life for the work of Christ. And he was at the point of death while trying to do for me the things you couldn't do because you were far away. He's talking about our friend Eric, Epiphordaeus. Epiphordaeus was at the church meeting one Sunday, and the collection for the relief fund for Paul was finally uh, reached its goal. It had matured. And then the next decision was, um, who will take it to Rome? Who? Who will take this to Paul? There wasn't any steamships or trains or airplanes. There was some roads that you could walk on, 800 miles of roads through a dozen different kingdoms at peril of all sorts of distress of bandits and even survival itself. Who will take this relief fund to Paul in Rome? Epiphordaeus was the guy who stood up and said, I'll do it. I'll live for something greater than just, than just myself. And Paul sees that as a quality of happiness. I kind of understand what Paul is saying as the course of years has matured me and I've heard what my elders have to say about what maturity and growing up. I've heard it said that you know, I climbed the ladder of success only to realize when I got to the top, the ladder was resting against the wrong wall. I've seen the agony in people's life when they are giving their first class allegiances to the second class causes in this life. And though those second class causes, commitments, well, they offer, they, they seem to offer some great joy, they never live up to the promise. And they make people feel betrayed and used afterwards and embarrassed. Big time commitment to small time causes is the sure formula to an unhappy and everlasting unhappy life. But the example of our Savior Jesus Christ is to live for something greater than yourself. Christ lived for your benefit, for mine. Christ lived and died for the everlasting benefit of us one and all. And he truly did it 
with the greatest joy. He was completely happy. Mark 8, 35, Jesus says, Only those who give away their lives for my sake and for the sake of the good news will ever know what it means to really live. And for four days, he did that. He had great joy. And Paul saw him as an exemplary life with Timothy for all of us to learn from. And anyone, anyone, even you today, anyone that chooses, that makes that choice with God's help to answer that call to live considered of one another for causes greater than your own self. Anyone who does that will receive a wondrous experience, a joy that's beyond countermeasure. And that's what we're talking about this month here at Avalon when we say join the happiness project. A concluding prayer, I invite everybody to pray with me. Lord Jesus, I ask for all our Avalon Church family, for all their families, and for all their acquaintances, Grant us your spiritual gift of joy that we always might be happy. Amen.